Hello, everyone. Hello, Grandmaster. Welcome to today's class. We'll continue to learn the Earth Store Sutra. Let's learn. Chapter 8, The Praises of King Yama and His Retinue. At that moment, from within the iron-enclosed mountains, countless ghost kings and King Yama all arrived at the Trayastrimsa heaven to learn the Buddha's teaching. There are many ghost kings. They were evil poison ghost king. Many evils ghost king. Great quarrels ghost king. White tiger ghost king. Blood tiger ghost king. Red tiger ghost king. Disaster disseminating ghost king. Flying body ghost king. Lightning flash ghost king. Wolf teeth ghost king. Thousand eyes ghost king. Beast devouring ghost king. Rock carrying ghost king. Ghost king of depletion. Ghost king of calamities. Ghost king of food. Ghost king of wealth. Ghost king of domestic animals. Ghost king of birds. Ghost king of beasts. Ghost king of monstrous creatures. Ghost king of birth. Ghost king of life. Ghost king of illnesses. Ghost king of danger. Three eyes ghost king. Four eyes ghost king. Five eyes ghost king. Chisless king. Great Chisless King. Chalixa King. Great Chalixa King. Anato King. Great Anato King and many other great ghost kings. There were hundreds of thousands of minor ghost kings, each of whom had duties to carry out and preside over. Through the awesome supernormal power of the Buddha, and the power of earth store bodhisattva, King Yama and the ghost kings came to Trayastrimsa heaven and stood respectfully to one side. King Yama is different from ghost kings. In the world of ghosts, King Yama is the highest leader. King Yama knelt with palms joined and said to the Buddha, World-honored one, the ghost kings and I are honored to attend this assembly in the Trayastrimsa heaven. It is a great opportunity for us to gain virtuous roots and blessings. I have a little question. And I seek for world-honored one's compassionate teaching. The Buddha told King Yama, Ask whatever you wish. I will explain it to you. At that time, King Yama paid reverence to the world-honored one, turned to behold earth store bodhisattva, and said to the Buddha, World-honored one, I observe that, Earth Store Bodhisattva uses countless skillful means in the six realms to guide wrongdoing suffering beings across to liberation, and he persists tirelessly. This is only possible because of this great Bodhisattva's inconceivable vows and supernormal power. Yet after these beings are released from the evil realms, they will soon fall into the evil realms again. Since Earth Store Bodhisattva has such inconceivable power, why don't these sentient beings live peacefully in the virtuous path and attain eternal liberation? World Honored One, Please explain this to me. The Buddha told King Yama, sentient beings on earth, 
have stubborn bad habits because of their karma. It's difficult to correct. Earth Store Bodhisattva has been rescuing them throughout long eons, helping them attain liberation early. Even when wrongdoers fall into the great hells, Earth Store Bodhisattva uses various supernormal powers to eliminate their fundamental karma. He helps them realize their past life events and how the karma affects them. However, sentient beings have severe bad habits of forming evil. As soon as they leave the evil realms, they fall back in again. Thus, Earth Store Bodhisattva rescues them repeatedly throughout long eons. Suppose there was a person who lost his way home and, by mistake, entered a dangerous path, in which there were many ghosts, demons, monsters, beasts and poisonous insects. Such a lost person was in danger and might lose his life at any moment. Suppose there was a virtuous friend. A virtuous friend is any kind person, not anyone specified. Suppose there was a virtuous friend who had many great skills, had expertise in detoxification, and could tackle yaksas and other evil beings. If the virtuous friend happened to meet this lost traveler, who was about to walk further on that dangerous path, and said to him, Hey, fellow, why are you walking on this path? It's dangerous here. Do you have any abilities to avoid these poisonous and evil beings? He kindly reminded the traveler. When the lost traveler heard the virtuous friend's words, he realized this was a dangerous path and stopped immediately. He pleaded the virtuous friend to take him to safety. The virtuous friend took his hand and led him from the dangerous path to the right path. So he'd be peaceful and happy. The virtuous friend said to the lost traveler, Do not walk on that path again. Those who enter it will have difficulty getting out. Moreover, they will suffer harm to their lives. The lost traveler was very grateful. As they were about to part, the virtuous friend said, If you see relatives, friends, or other travelers, Tell them about this dangerous path, where many poisonous and evil creatures will take their lives. Do not allow them to bring about their own deaths. Then, the Buddha continued to explain to King Yama in the assembly. In the same way, Earth Store Bodhisattva compassionately rescues sentient beings from suffering so they are reborn in the human or heaven realm and are peaceful and joyous. These beings realize how agonizing the evil realms are. After they obtain release, they would never go on those paths again. They are like the lost traveler who accidentally entered a dangerous path. They would never enter an evil path again after being saved by the virtuous friend. If they see others entering that path, they'd tell them not to enter. They'd tell them how they went astray, how they got help, and how they got liberated. They'd also tell them that walking on the evil path was unexpectedly dangerous and they may lose their lives. If they fall into an evil realm again, Earth Store Bodhisattva will use skillful means to rescue them and help them be reborn in the human or heaven realm.
But shortly after their release, they fall into the evil realms again. They quickly fall to the evil realms. What a pity! If they have heavy karmic effects, they will remain in hell forever, without a time of release. At this time, evil poison ghost king joined his palms in respect and said to the Buddha, World-honored one, there are countless ghost kings on earth. Some of the ghost kings help people, and some harm people. However, our karmic effects cause us ghosts to travel the world. Doing many bad deeds, and few virtuous deeds, he pointed out that most ghosts do more bad than good. We pass through people's homes, cities, and villages. We may find people cultivating a little virtuous deeds. They may hang a banner or a canopy, offer a little incense or a few flowers, or make offerings to the images of Buddhas or Bodhisattvas. They may read the Earth Store Sutra, or burn incense as an offering to even a sentence or a verse in this sutra. All ghost kings will respect such people just as we do for all Buddhas. This is what they would do. We will command our subordinate ghosts and the earth deities to protect these beings with their great power. We will prevent unfortunate events, sudden calamities, severe illnesses, and any undesirable events from coming near their home, much less entering their doors. The Buddha praised evil poison ghost king. Excellent! All you ghost kings and King Yama, King Yama is their leader, can support and protect kind men and kind women in this way. I will tell King Brahma and King Sakra to protect all of you as well. They are kind. They protect beings who have even little kindness and compassion. Although these people still have sins, when they do a few good deeds or make a little offerings, the ghosts will respect them as Buddhas. This is amazing. The ghost kings are compassionate. Did you know that? The Buddha said, since you are compassionate, I'll give you greater benefits. I will tell Sakra and other heavenly kings to protect all of you as well. How nice it is. In the assembly is a ghost king named Ghost King of Life. Please remember the Ghost King of Life, who is quite special. Ghost King of Life said respectfully, World Honored One, because of my karma, I preside over a human's life on earth. I am in charge of both the birth and the death. He is powerful. He's in charge of our life, from birth to death. As in my vows, I wish to help sentient beings. However, sentient beings do not realize my intention and can't find peace in either birth or death. Why is this? When people are pregnant with children, whether boys or girls, or when they are about to give birth, their family should do virtuous deeds to increase the blessing in their household. Then, the local earth deities will joyfully protect the mother and child. So the mother, newborn and the family will have peace, happiness and blessings. You need to respect and make offerings to earth deities. There are earth deities no matter where you live. After having a newborn, the family should not kill anymore. 
Don't kill animals to restore the new mother's health. Other foods can also help to restore health. Don't kill. Don't invite relatives and friends to celebrate with a feast. Because drinking alcohol, eating meat, singing and entertaining will disturb the peace of the mother and child. Why is this? During childbirth, many evil ghosts come to consume the foul blood. I command local earth deities early on to protect the mother and child, so they are peaceful and happy, seeing that the mother and child are safe. The family should make offerings to the earth deity in gratitude. Instead, they gather relatives for feasting and kill other beings. As a result, the mother and child become accessories to the wrongdoing and bear the karma. When people are dying, regardless of whether they are kind or evil, I wish they won't fall into the evil realms. If they have cultivated virtuous roots, I can help them even more. Even if the dying person has done kind deeds, many evil ghosts will disguise themselves as his parents or relatives to lead him into the evil realms. How much more so for the wrongdoers? World Honored One, when a person is dying, his consciousness is unclear. He is unable to distinguish kind from evil. He is unable to see and hear. It's an unconscious state that feels worse than being drunk. You can't see or hear at all. In behalf of the dying person, his relatives should do meritorious deeds. Make great offerings, read the Earth Store Sutra, and chant the names of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Such merits and virtues can help the deceased one to avoid the evil realms. And all demons and ghosts will withdraw and disperse. World Honored One, when sentient beings are dying, if they can hear a Buddha's name, a Bodhisattva's name, or a sentence or a verse from the Mahayana Sutras. I observe that these people will be quickly liberated from minor evil karma, except those who have committed the five heinous crimes. The Buddha told Ghost King of Life, because of your great compassion, you can make such great vows and protect all beings amid their births and deaths. In the future, when people reach their birth and death, do not regress from your compassionate vows. Help them to gain liberation, eternal peace and happiness. The Ghost King said, World Honored One, Please do not be concerned. I'll make every effort to support and protect sentient beings so that they gain peace and happiness both at birth and death. He will protect sentient beings at their birth and death. I wish they can believe my words at birth and death so that they will all be liberated and gain great benefits. At that time, the Buddha said to Earth Store Bodhisattva, Ghost King of Life, has been a great ghost king for thousands of lives. He protects sentient beings amid their births and deaths. Ghost King of Life, a great Bodhisattva, manifests as a ghost king because he has such compassionate vows. In reality, he is not a ghost. He is a great bodhisattva. After 170 eons, he will become a Buddha named Absence of Appearance to Thagata. His eon will be called Peace and Happiness, and his world will be named Pure Abode. This Buddha's lifespan will be incalculable, which means eternal. 
earth store bodhisattva, this great ghost king has done inconceivable deeds. He has guided immeasurable heavenly beings and humans across to liberation. That is the completion of Chapter 8. Hello, Master. First, there is a new character in this chapter, King Yama. Could you please introduce who King Yama is? King Yama preside over life and death. He controls life and death, fortune and misfortune, good and bad, social status, and wealth. As he controls life, he controls rebirth. Based on people's merits, he decides which family they should go to and how much good or bad fortune they should have. Say, if a person has few merits, he would be reborn in poverty or suffering. He would have disabilities. He would be reborn in a war zone or other bad environments. If a person has many merits, they would be reborn in a rich or noble family. For example, the person may become a king, a queen, a king's consort, or a noble person. King Yama makes the decision. Among the six realms, he is the greatest leader with the greatest power. Hello, Master. I have the same question as King Yama. After Earth Store Bodhisattva rescues sentient beings from the evil realms, why do they fall in there again soon? How can sentient beings fundamentally eliminate their evil karma? Master, please explain it to us again. I'm also thinking. Buddha said sentient beings are persistent. And the word he used was adamant. Adamant also means stubborn and unrepentant. For example, smoking and drinking. Many people may say, it's okay. I've been smoking for 30 years. Look at cigarette boxes. There are warnings that smoking causes cancer. But smokers don't care, it's like they never see it. They know it may cause illness, but what do they think? I'm used to smoking, I can't quit. Everyone will die somehow. Does it really cause cancers? Does it really cause cancers? He got cancer because of bad luck. They may say these things. They like to take their chances. Drinkers and drug users have similar minds. Some people like to eat betel nut. When I first arrived in Taiwan, I saw some manual laborers in rural areas. They often stop to spit some blood while carrying heavy things. I initially thought it was because they were too tired. They said, no, don't be afraid, it's because I'm chewing betel nut. They explained it to me. Then I found out that many small shops sell betel nuts, even different flavors. Of course, I've never tasted it. Later, I met a doctor in Taiwan. He told me many people who chew betel nuts frequently will develop throat, oral, cancers. Their teeth or jaw bone may need to be removed. It's a major surgery. Their face may deform. Chewing betel nuts as a habit caused these people diseases and other injuries. But his patients continued to chew betel nuts after their surgeries. Why? It's their habit. So why do people have different destinies? Some people can succeed. They may have a doctorate degree, become a professor, or have research achievements. They may find a good job with their higher academic degree. They could support their family easily. Some people don't like studying, so they don't go to college. To avoid exercise, some give up on losing weight. They want to be lazy and doesn't want wealth. Such people don't fight against others. In fact, they fight against their weakness. For example, 
I'm teaching energy Bhagwa to some students. If a student has learned a little about the Bhagwa martial art before, it's difficult to correct his postures. Your hand posture is wrong, correct it this way. At that moment, he corrects it, but on the next day, it goes back again, like a spring bouncing back. We won't be able to correct his posture, even after 150 days. It's this hard. It's called self-attachment. You can't correct yourself. You're always right, that's final. I know a man whose father ran a real estate company in China. This man studied management in France. His program was four years long, but after two years, he said, I know everything, so no more learning. He said his father was too old-fashioned in business, too foolish, and uneducated. He said, I have the knowledge of modern management. It's simple. I will take my father's company public on the New York Stock Exchange, and I'll make it bigger. I'll also build my real estate kingdom. I'll build the best high-end residential area in my province. Each unit has a security guard and two elevators. His plan was amazing. I'll have peacocks there. You may want to have a phoenix. It was great in his imagination. I'll build a food kingdom. Because he had money, he kept daydreaming. I like French cuisine. I'll combine it with Chinese cuisine and create a fusion food kingdom. I'll build a car kingdom and organize a car rally. Since we promote exercising, I'll organize a provincial Chinese-French marathon. Then, he went home. He spent 5 million renminbi to open a chain restaurant. He had a perfect plan. Nothing extravagant, just a simple business, like McDonald's. After opening the first restaurant, his father and he video called me. They said that it was not bad. Hundreds of people came to the grand opening. I wanted to know if people still come after a week. Only four people went there on the following Sunday. No one came to eat on Monday. They didn't know why. Master, why is there no customers? I asked, is it too expensive or cheap? He said, it's not expensive. 20 US dollars for a combo. What's included in the combo? A Chinese hamburger. And a soup. That's it. All right. Who set the price? My son. His son planned everything. All the plates were silver-plated. The teacups were gilded glass. The waiters wore French-style uniforms. They serve local Chinese food but used everything made in France, including machines. His son said, it's okay because we can't have a big business in one day. Maybe I'll make money if I open seven chain restaurants. And the result? He has already opened two more. And, he lost a few hundred thousand dollars monthly. His father was so mad that his lips were green. In the end, the business failed. The son went to a fortune teller from Wutai Mountain. The fortune teller said, you're not suitable for the food business. He said, Dad, let me run your real estate company. I'll turn it into a real estate empire. You'll destroy it. If you run it, the end will come. His father said, forget it. Son, you're still young. Regardless of how you do it, a successful result is the most important. What mistake did the son make? Arrogance. It's called self-attachment in Buddhism. He only read a few management papers. Can elite university graduates with a business management major manage a business well and make a quick buck? Not necessarily. Indeed. Arrogant people are all self-attached.
I'm right. I'm the best. I'm always right. Don't give me advice. The person who studied in France underestimated his father too much. He hadn't made money yet but had already despised his father. The son didn't come from a poor family. But his father did, which stimulated his father to succeed. That's why his father could run a big company successfully. The son didn't experience such adversity. There is a billionaire named Tsai in Taiwan. He is one of the richest men. His father was also one of the richest men in Taiwan. His father left him with a large legacy, but Tsai overestimated himself. When doing his first business, he was immediately deceived by others. He broke the law and was put in jail. His father's legacy was not enough to pay for his debts. For years in prison, Tsai slapped himself in the face every day. Finally, he awakened. He exercised, read books, and learned how to do business well. He learned how to be a good person and how to achieve success. He was released after seven years and never dared to be arrogant again. He started fresh and changed his personality. Ten years later, he became the richest man again. Today, he refuses to talk to the public. He doesn't want to be mentioned in the newspaper. He's really a low-key man now. But all Taiwanese know that he is a super-rich man. You have to go through such hardships to know the pain. Before, everyone knew you were rich and wanted to be your friend. After you get released, you can't even borrow a dollar. Your old friends look away and pretend not to know you. When you try to borrow money from people who owe you and those you helped, they will avoid you and pretend not to know you. Such pain makes you rethink how to be a person. Why do sentient beings go to hell, then heaven, and then fall into hell again? They forget their mistakes. They forget the pain of losing everything. Then, they revere Buddha and pray. With a calm mind, they'll make a fortune. Temptations come with wealth. Then they will fall for it again, right? Master, the Sutra mentions. If people have done even a few kind deeds, ghost kings will respect them like they respect all Buddhas. Why is this? Please enlighten us on this matter. Ordinary people are self-centered. For example, I only want delicious, good-looking, easy-to-use, fragrant, beautiful, and valuable things, such as big houses, expensive cars, lots of money, an attractive body, beautiful clothes, a fancy title, even a pair of beautiful glasses or expensive watches. Where does the value of all this come from? They are valuable because I want them. I like them. I have money to buy them. I wear them because they make me look good. Everything revolves around me. I eat delicious food. This is the characteristic of sentient beings. It's all for myself. The Buddha told us, when a person pursues what they want, they have the egotistical self, a self with limited breadth. What are the benefits of having an egotistical self? Insatiable greed. What are the disadvantages? They can't get liberated. They can't succeed. They'll fail in big businesses. They won't become great men or saints. They can't make a great fortune. Even if they did, their wealth is temporary, and they will waste it later. So many super-entrepreneurs in the world may initially start their businesses to earn money and make a living. 
They originally just wanted their children to be well-educated and live better. After becoming wealthy, they start cultivating their minds with people like me. After learning from Buddhist masters, they want to benefit all sentient beings. Why do they have this wish? They want everyone to enjoy their product. They want their employees to support their families well. Chuck Feeney is a businessman who sold luxury products in airports worldwide. He has donated, in a low-key way, more than $10 billion to charities worldwide. Bill Gates, a founder of Microsoft, set up a charity fund with more than $10 billion, with Warren Buffett's and other people's support. They do great philanthropic work internationally. There is a legendary entrepreneur in Japan, Kazuo Inamori. After his company made money, he shared the company stocks and profits with his employees. After learning Buddhism, an entrepreneur will benefit all sentient beings. Thus, many Japanese regard him as the god of business. I believe some even pay respect to his image at home. Therefore, we should have such an altruistic mind. The egotistical self is too selfish. Only focusing on the needs of oneself. Have an altruistic mind, which is willing to give and benefit others. The more you want to benefit others, the greater the achievement you'll have. You can start from small offerings. Initially, all you think about is receiving. Now, you start offering, although your goal is still receiving. It's an act of giving. This is the turning point of your nature. You're giving instead of receiving. Although you give with the intention of exchange and greed, it's still giving. In the beginning, you may only give someone some food. You may give one dollar to help others. If you make a lot of money later, you may donate 100 million. You may even help 100 million people. It all begins when you make the first offering or donation, which is also the turning point of your fate. The Buddha said, I can become a Buddha, and so can all sentient beings. If you start giving and benefiting sentient beings from today on, begin by making offerings to me or any small good deed, maybe you will become a Buddha tomorrow. So, why will the ghost kings protect you right away? Right now, a person may only give a piece of bread or a dollar. He may be poor, selfish, and has many bad habits. But after 10 or 20 years, he may have the highest achievement and become a great person. The ghost kings are divine beings. They see that this person's future has changed. So, they respect the ordinary person you are now, and the Buddha you will become. The Sutra also says, after having a newborn, do not kill animals to restore the new mother's health. Celebrating with feasts and entertainment is not beneficial for the mother or the newborn. What's the most reasonable way to celebrate the birth of a child? Here's a question. Meat aside, is there anything in vegetarian diets that can restore a new mother's health? Yes, millet porridge, red dates, tofu, sweet rice wine, sweet rice wine, red dates. Don't underestimate vegetarian diets. Many vegetarian foods are great tonics. Ginseng is vegetarian and has great tonic power. There are many tonifying foods, even red dates. It's easy for you to buy a book or search online. Many vegetarian foods are more tonifying than meat. So taking a moderate amount is enough. Ask your grandparents. They know it well. The Buddha said, don't kill animals for this celebration. Having a new child is a happy occasion. But if you kill animals to help the mother recover, and to celebrate the birth of the child, 
It increases the negative karma of the mother and the child. So please do as the Buddha said. I like vegetarian weddings very much. In Taiwan, several Bodhi meditation practitioners got married in our meditation hall and catered vegetarian food. This is nice. Don't let our weddings or happiness cause the suffering of other beings. A vegetarian celebration is excellent. What should you do if you have killed animals when your child was born? For example, you can make offerings to sutra, chant, offer light, help others, make offerings, gild Buddha statues or print canons. There are many ways to make up for it, because all sentient beings are ignorant. We often make mistakes, like this one. So when you understand it, learn to restrain yourself and remind yourself not to offend again. If you re-offend after reading this sutra, you are recklessly bold. Do not do it. To prevent re-offending, read this sutra when you have time. We could make other mistakes too. It's hard to avoid making mistakes in our lives, right? So first, we should want to make corrections. We repent and don't do it again. If you have bad habits such as smoking, drinking alcohol or taking drugs, Vow in front of the Buddha. Don't swear to chop off a finger if you re-offend. Use your spirit to tell yourself, I will not do it again. Tell yourself it's sinful and harmful. We should be self-conscious and capable of self-discipline. This is a true hero. The Sutra says, even at the end of kind people's lives, evil ghosts may disguise as their relatives to lead them into the evil realms. It's more prevalent for people who have committed evil acts. Master, how can we help our dying relatives to avoid this temptation and not fall to the evil realms? It's explained in the Sutra. You should make offerings to Buddhas. Offer flowers and incense to Buddhas and this sutra. Or, chant the names of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. These are all great ways for self-liberation. And the real Buddhas and Bodhisattvas may come and pick you up. It's possible. Actually, I have also pondered this question. When a person is on the verge of death, they may be sick, and their energy is exhausted. Without energy, their mind is unclear, especially when nearing the end. They can't see or hear clearly. They hear buzzing noises. So they don't have a clear mind to think and judge what is real or fake. They don't have energy at all. What should be done? It is all based on your merits, virtues, and blessings. These are the most important foundations. Second, a Buddha appears to you because of your merits and virtues. The third I know is, keeping the Dharma tool your master gave you to protect yourself, or a picture of your master. Whether you are buried or cremated after you die, you should have a picture of your master or Buddha with you. And, hold the Dharma tool in your hand. This is also why we made some wooden Dharma tools. These are wooden prayer beads, Vajra pestles, Furba, and even pendants with images of Bodhisattvas. You should wear those things. Everyone will leave this world someday. These wooden ones will follow you whether you go through cremation or burial. It's very convenient. They can accompany you and protect you. You will not face evil ghosts and demons. We hope that genuine Buddhists especially Bodhi disciples who learn from me, won't see illusions when they leave the world.
Instead, real Buddhas and Bodhisattvas will come to embrace you. I remember someone asked, if they or their relatives could wear Bodhi meditation clothes before death, wear at least three pieces, if, one day, you are seriously ill, or about to leave this world, wearing our Bodhi meditation clothes, will only benefit you. Buddhas will recognize the Bodhi meditation items you wear. Evil ghosts and other evil creatures will not dare to come near you. This is my blessing to you. If you have our peach wood treasures, hold the firba in your left hand, and hold the vitra pestle in your right hand. Tell your family in advance. Put these in your hand when your life's journey completes. That will be better. The evil creatures will not come. Some viewers ask personal questions and would like Master's guidance. I dreamed of scenes from the past featuring my deceased relatives and me. Do I need to chant and do virtuous deeds for them? This question is very good. If you have such a dream and make merits for them, first and foremost, you are a filial child. It is indeed necessary. Sometimes, it's hard to tell whether they came to your dream to ask for something. Ghosts always come to your dream for a reason. They come for a reason or out of necessity. What you dreamed of was nothing ominous. And such life scenes from the past mean that the deceased is missing you. In this case, I suggest doing meritorious deeds for him. Why? If he always appears in your dreams, disasters or severe illness will come soon. A viewer said, I often dream of lying with a deceased person. It's very troublesome. Really terrible. You must do great deeds, otherwise, disasters will come, so be careful. Thank you, Master. You're welcome. A viewer said, my grandparents died many years ago. Once, I dreamed that my grandparents' home had an image of the three noble ones of the West. They didn't have a religion, but they were honest and kind. Master, is this a good dream? Yes. It is. He dreamed of his grandparents, who passed away many years ago. And, there was an image of the three noble ones of the West. One possibility is that the grandparents have been liberated there through their descendants' merits and virtues from light offerings or soul salvation. They came to say they've liberated. This is a general possibility. This is auspicious. When my father passed away a few years ago, I offered light at Bodhi meditation and did soul salvation in other temples. Once, I dreamed of him standing under a red apple tree. He asked if he could pick fruits. I said yes, and my father smiled at me. Then, I woke up. Master, was my father reborn? The message that your deceased relative send you in a dream is composed of everything in that dream. They may not speak to you directly, because they may be in a spirit form. They may be suffering in hell, or may have been reborn. That's all possible. So when they send a message, they seldom use human languages, but the scenes in your dreams are their languages. You must interpret. This viewer offered light at Bodhi meditation for his father's soul salvation. Then, he dreamed that his father stood under a big red apple tree and asked, Can I pick the fruits? This dream indicates sweet fruition and peace. His father has been reborn peacefully. Red apples symbolize good fortune, wealth and auspiciousness. Congratulations to your father. He has been reborn in a wealthy and auspicious family. Another viewer asked, My father passed away almost three years ago. A few months ago, my eldest sister dreamed our dad was lying in a temple. 
and asked my sister to purify his body. Hearing this, I made a year-long light offering to purify my father. Is it a good dream, Master? This dream is quite straightforward. First, lying in a temple is a good thing, but it's unclear whether he has been liberated. Second, he asked the eldest daughter to purify his body. The father was sending a message to the eldest sister, who is his daughter. You need to do meritorious deeds for your father. Wanting to be purified means he has karmic debts, like having dirt on his body, right? You have to gain merits to purify him and eliminate karma. Only after that could he be reborn in a good place. Otherwise, he doesn't have enough merits. He was in a temple. Buddha want to help him. You don't have enough merits. You know your children are not filial. It's a chance to help your eldest daughter. If she can be filial and assist you, you can go to a better place. Your father sent the message to your eldest sister. Please be filial and do meritorious deeds for your father. Thank you, Master. Master, a viewer dreamed of his deceased mother, sunbathing in a house without walls on two sides. It felt like the sunlight at about two o'clock in the afternoon. Master, what does this dream mean? My intuition is that the mother hasn't been reborn yet. Maybe she's still down there. She needs her family to do meritorious deeds for her. A house that is missing two walls means a lack of merits and virtues. You need to repair the walls so the house is complete. Yes, she lacks the merits to be reborn, especially when it's 2 p.m. and sunlight is still strong. It's not too late, and you still have time. A viewer said, Hello, Master, I dreamed of my deceased grandfather. When he was alive, he couldn't walk for decades because of a traffic accident. In my dream, I saw my grandpa walking slowly toward me. I said, Grandpa, you can walk now. He said yes. He glanced at me and then walked away. As he left, his body became smaller. He became a young boy and disappeared. Master, was my grandfather reborn? He has likely been reborn. Yes. This message is straightforward. An old man in your dream turned into a young boy and left. That is already very clear. He was reborn in a family as a boy. Right. If you felt joyful, it means he is in a noble and happy family. It's a good dream. Several viewers dreamed of dining with their deceased relatives. What does this mean, Master? This is not very good. It means you have to burn Joss paper money and offer food to them. On festivals or their anniversary days. Master, what is making great offerings? In this sutra, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas and the ghost kings said we need to make great offerings. What are great offerings? Remember, in one of Earth store Bodhisattva's past lives, he was a girl called Bright Eyes. She sold all her favorite possessions. For her family, it was a great offering. There's another situation. Some people may not have much money, but they are sincere. Like the story we discussed. A poor lady, who offered light, with the only dollar she had. So she received great merits. She gave everything she had. It's a matter of ratio. Say I have a million dollars and I offered ten thousand dollars. It's a smaller offering. If you have a million dollars, and you offered three hundred thousand dollars, it could be considered as a great offering. But at Bodhi meditation, we want you to maintain a normal life. 
We don't want you to spend too much making offerings. Otherwise, we will not be happy. Thank you, Master. By learning this sutra, you'll change many bad habits and find your direction in life. Also, you'll stop doing many things. You won't be extravagant. You won't exaggerate, steal, deceive or lie. You won't waste. You won't aim impossibly high. You won't be arrogant. And you'll respect others. The most important thing we learned in this sutra is that we'll go to hell if we do the wrong things. How much money you have doesn't affect whether you go to hell. If you get rich by greedy means, you can only go to hell because you have no merits. Not to mention if you got money by deceiving others. If you have a severe illness or dream of deceased relatives, you should do meritorious deeds. If your deceased elders are suffering in hell, it's difficult for us to have auspiciousness in life. I hope you can do meritorious deeds so you and your descendants could avoid hell. Go to a good family on earth. Go to heaven or even the world of ultimate bliss. I hope you all can understand this sutra and put it in practice. You must keep your words. Received. Now, everyone's thoughts return to the Treyastrimsa heaven. Let's focus on the conversation between the Buddha, Earth Store Bodhisattva, and other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in the assembly. Chapter 9 Chanting the Names of Buddhas. At that time, Earth Store Bodhisattva said to the Buddha, World Honored One, now, I'll explain for future sentient beings how to obtain great liberation and great benefits while in the suffering cycle of birth and death. Please allow me to speak on this. The Buddha told Earth Store Bodhisattva, you wish to inspire great compassion to rescue sentient beings in the six realms, and to explain an inconceivable liberation method. The time is right. You should speak at once. Soon, I will enter nirvana. If you fulfill your vows early, I will not need to worry about all sentient beings in the present and future. Earth Store Bodhisattva said to the Buddha, World Honored One, immeasurable eons ago, there was a Buddha in the world. His name was Boundless Body Tathagata. If people hear this Buddha's name and as soon as they develop reverence for him, they will transcend forty eons of severe punishments of birth and death. Forty eons is a very long time. There may be thousands and millions of generations in this time. How much more so when they sculpt and paint his image, make offerings and sing his praises, the merits they gain will be immeasurable and boundless. Moreover, immeasurable eons ago, there was another Buddha in the world. His name was Jewel Nature Tathagata. If people hear this Buddha's name and aspire to take refuge in this Buddha in an instant, these people will never regress on the self-cultivation road toward Buddhahood. In paying reverence to each Buddha, the benefits we gain are a little different. Yes, there's a disposition, let's continue. Moreover, immeasurable eons ago, there was a Buddha 
whose name was Supreme Lotus Tathagata. If people hear this Buddha's name, they will be reborn in the heaven realm for a thousand times. How much more so when they chant his name sincerely? Everyone has heard the names of a few Buddhas. We can gain immense benefits when we hear their names. Moreover, immeasurable eons ago, there was another Buddha in the world. His name was Lion's Roar to Thagata. If people hear this Buddha's name, immediately takes refuge in this Buddha and feel a sense of belonging, they will receive predictions of their future Buddhahood from countless Buddhas. This is amazing. It's sacred to have countless Buddhas' predictions of your future Buddhahood. If you have some basic knowledge of Buddhism, you'll know it's an extremely rare and precious opportunity. Moreover, in the distant past, there was a Buddha in the world. His name was Krakuchanda Buddha. If people hear this Buddha's name and sincerely pay reverence to him, these people will become great Brahma kings in the Thousand Buddha Assembly. You have heard the name. If you have reverence, you'll gain this benefit in the future. You'll become great Brahma kings in the Thousand Buddha Assembly. Brahma is the king of a huge heaven. You will obtain great wisdom. Moreover, inexpressibly inexpressible eons ago, there was a Buddha in the world. His name was Vipassian Buddha. If people hear this Buddha's name, they will never fall into the evil realms and always be reborn in the human realm or heaven realm, enjoying a beautiful life. It's wonderful. Moreover, in the long distant past, there was a Buddha in the world. His name was Jewel-born Tathagata. If people hear this Buddha's name, they will never fall into the evil realms and will frequently be reborn in the heavens, experiencing wondrous joy. It's excellent. You gain benefits again. Let's continue. Moreover, a very long time ago, there was a Buddha in the world. His name was Jewel Appearance to Thagata. If people hear this Buddha's name and develop reverence, these people will soon attain arhatship. In Buddhism, the state of arhat is the highest attainment achieved by practicing meditation. It's extraordinary. An arhat is not a Buddha, but is as significant as a Buddha. It's a supreme attainment. It's extraordinary. So if you hear this Buddha's name, Jewel Appearance to Thagata, you'll soon achieve the arhat attainment. It's incredible. This Buddha is giving us powerful blessings and strength. All right, next. A very long time ago, there was a Buddha in the world. His name was Buddhist Robe Banner to Thagata. If people hear this Buddha's name, they will transcend 100 great eons of punishments of birth and death. Moreover, in the long distant past, there was a Buddha in the world named Great Penetration Mountain King Tathagata. If people hear this Buddha's name, countless Buddhas will extensively explain the Dharma to them. They will certainly attain Bodhi and achieve Buddhahood. You're happy hearing this, right? During self-cultivation, usually, a person cannot simply achieve Buddhahood by their effort. 
but with Buddha's blessing, you can quickly advance to Buddhahood. A super-rich man could make you rich overnight by giving you half his money, right? So it's much faster when a Buddha makes you attain Buddhahood. Moreover, in the past, there was pure moon Buddha, mountain king Buddha, wisdom excellence Buddha, pure name king Buddha, wisdom accomplished Buddha, unsurpassed Buddha, wondrous sound Buddha, full moon Buddha, and moon face Buddha. There were inexpressibly many Buddhas such as these. World Honored One Sentient beings in the present and future will attain immeasurable merits and virtues. By chanting a Buddha's name, how much more so when they chant or hear many Buddha's names? They will benefit greatly during birth and death, and never fall into the evil realms. All Buddhas aim to prevent us from suffering, help everyone achieve enlightenment and become compassionate. If a person is dying and his relatives, even just one of them, loudly chants a Buddha's name on behalf of him, the dying person's karmic effects will be eliminated, with the exception of the five heinous crimes. Five heinous crimes are abominable crimes, such as killing parents or monks, persecuting Buddhism, etc. Except for these severe sins, the rest will be eliminated. Actually, many people haven't done the five heinous crimes in past lives, right? They did only minor offenses, so their karma can be eliminated quickly, and they won't fall into the evil realms. How great it is! The five heinous crimes are extremely severe, and the offender will suffer in hell through millions of eons without release. Nevertheless, by the virtues of other people chanting, the names of Buddhas on the offender's behalf when he is dying, even the torments from such severe offenses can gradually diminish. How much more so when sentient beings chant for themselves? That means don't wait for your death to chant. Chant in advance, right? Chanting in advance is self-saving. It clears away your crimes and evil karma. Remember, keep a repentant heart to eliminate evil karma and prevent repeating the same mistake. If sentient beings can chant in advance for themselves, then when they are dying, their evil karma has been eliminated so they won't go to hell. The king of hell will judge them to be reborn in heaven directly, in the Treyastrimsa heaven. Wonderful! That is the completion of chapter 9. When we hear the name lions roar to Thagata, and in one thought take refuge in him, we will meet countless Buddhas and receive predictions of future Buddhahood. Master, please explain to us. Take refuge in one thought and Buddha placing a hand on the crown of one's head and giving a prediction of future Buddhahood. We all have emotional reactions, right? For example, you're unhappy. It's your consciousness. It's a thought in your mind. I'm unhappy. That's called one thought. Suppose you've learned from me, especially teenagers, you can recite Grandmaster Jean Bodhi's golden words in the morning. I am most happy, I am most confident. As you think of this and shout twice, you're happy and confident. In one thought, you reverse instantly. There is an instant shift in your mind. You realize your weakness emerged again. Shift perspective, what is thought? It's a single point in consciousness. That's a general explanation of one thought. Take refuge in one thought means you instantly feel joy and admiration. Seeing an image of Buddha, you want to take refuge. 
depend on and rely on that Buddha. What is reliance? We rely when there's a lack of strength. I don't have strength, so I need something to support myself. Relying on is having support from something. For example, a wall, a tree, or a mountain can be my support. Because I don't have strength. In fact, we often question our abilities in life. We may feel a lack of energy or wisdom, or I may not get through the current troubles that worry me. So I must find someone to rely on, especially gods or Buddhas, or someone powerful. This is reliance. They must be powerful, full of energy. So, you can rely on them. What we just talked about is similar to taking refuge. But it's a higher level of reliance from consciousness. That means all my beliefs and behaviors. Rely on the Buddha's teaching and guidance. That's a higher level. Now we roughly understand taking refuge in one thought. Someone may say, I'll verify if Buddhas really exist. After 30 years, you may see the king of hell. You have no time to take refuge, improve yourself, do meritorious deeds or learn. So we should have respect when we hear Buddha's names, see Buddha's images, or when we meet a good master. It's not because a master is handsome or beautiful, but you feel a special sense of respect and reliance. This thought that arises instantly is taking refuge in one thought, and sometimes, it's called fate. It's like attraction. I like it. This feeling is hard to explain. It's not falling in love. It's similar to I like him. I like listening to him. Master, I think one thought also means going deep into one field, without betrayal, and taking refuge in the Buddha and Master. What you said is particularly important. Once I met a man in our meditation center, I didn't know him, but felt he had come to Bodhi meditation before. So when I chatted with him, I kept observing him. When he talked about his health issues, I said, you should practice self-cultivation. He said, Master, I'm already a disciple. Do you practice? I practiced for a few days, but I stopped, so I'm in poor health now. He had lots of negative energy. He was too weak to stand a gust of wind. I said, you are nothing like a disciple of mine. My disciples practice genuinely. Even if they're unhealthy, they're still healthier than you. You last practiced a long time ago and didn't practice well. You don't understand. After learning from me, he went to other schools. He learned many methods but didn't practice any. He didn't go deep into one method and take refuge in one thought. He wanted to take refuge in Master, and see if there were any benefits. Many benefits are in the long term. The instant benefits are invisible to your naked eye. For taking refuge in one thought, first, it's an instant decision arising from happiness. Second, you can't be half-hearted. You must go deep in one field. It also means being sincere, without pretending or reservation. Have absolute sincerity. When you take refuge in Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, the supreme state of Buddhas placing their hands on the crowns of our heads and giving predictions of future Buddhahood. In the Sutra, the Buddha mentioned this prediction many times. If self-cultivators, who have almost achieved enlightenment, receive this prediction from a Buddha, they'll become a Buddha or Bodhisattva. Of course, they may achieve a third state, an Arhat. These are outstanding states. Buddhas only give predictions of future Buddhahood for these three states of beings. It means Buddhas believe you can attain Buddhahood and give you their blessings. 
It's thought that the Buddha put his hand on the head of the receiver, especially when the Buddha was alive. This is the first type. For the second, you see a Buddha giving you prediction of future Buddhahood. It's described in many sutras. It's called empowerment. When Buddhas give predictions, they may not actually use their hands. When Buddhas look at you with their divine eyes, they've already given you the predictions. The person receiving the prediction can see and hear it happening. It's sacred. Ordinary people may not understand. Many great masters have received predictions in this way, including me. I received the prediction of future Buddhahood from Amitabha Buddha. When I was very young, it's like seeing the Buddha's hand there. It's not a physical hand because Buddhas transcend physical life forms. It is precious and cannot be asked for. One receives Buddha's predictions, not by their intelligence but their sincerity. Receiving this prediction doesn't mean your body will be stronger. If not in this lifetime, you'll definitely become a Buddha in the future. This is the meaning. In self-cultivation, when a master passes down his lineage, there's a similar blessing called empowerment. I'll explain this type of empowerment in general. For example, you are sincere and do lots of physical work daily, like providing service for your master and helping with housework. You have no time to meditate, not to mention practice Buddha Dharma. You don't know what the sutras say. You just do lots of housework. You may farm for your master or earn money to support him. In this example, you don't self-cultivate at all. One day, your master may say, you can teach everyone Buddha Dharma and give blessings now. You might say, I'm honored to be your disciple for ten years, but I haven't read any sutra or meditated. I know nothing about teaching Buddha Dharma. How can I teach? Your master says, you can. Having stepped to the stage, you teach well. You can't believe that you are the one teaching. It's because your master, representing Buddhas, has empowered you with wisdom. Not to speak of Buddhas, even a master with smaller attainments like me can empower disciples so they can give blessings and energy healings. You may say, Master, can I do that? I'm still unhealthy. I say, you can. Sometimes, I had to spend an hour telling them, you are capable, believe me, you can do it. Some may say, I'm sure I can't. I can't. That's impossible. I have a disciple who is a Tibetan monk. His former master told him that he would never achieve enlightenment. I said, you can do it a month after learning from me. It's because the Buddha said, I've become a Buddha, so everyone can become a Buddha. I said, I've given you energy. When did you do that? Why didn't I see it? He asked. I said, when you bought me a lunchbox. That was years ago. Once, I didn't eat for three days, and I felt hungry. I wanted to eat a bowl of rice. At that time, he had only met me once. That day, he bought lunch for himself. But when he saw me, he asked, Master, are you hungry? I said, you brought food. He said, sure, I can give this to you. I met him again two days later. I thought he was really nice. He had not yet become my disciple, but sat naturally kneeling before me. Seeing this, I knew he was my disciple in my previous life. I said, it would be great if you could help sentient beings from now on. He asked, how? I said, eliminate disasters and diseases for them. 
Of course. But my master said that I could never do that. I must suffer and only do physical work. I said, he is testing you. He was a monk, so he had a master. I said, your master is testing you. He asked, am I capable? I said, yes, you can. I gave blessings to him with my voice. I said, yes, you can. I was using that tone. He said, am I capable just because you said so? I said, believe it or not, you can do it. How should I do it? If they have a headache, just fan with your hands. And the pain will disappear. I said, just think like that. Then he tried it. He met an old lady who had years of migraines. Then he fanned her. Is there still pain? He was nervous and sweating a lot. She felt pain at first. After fanning for 15 minutes, his heart calmed down. He wished the lady could be pain-free. He was relaxed and kept fanning. Then she said, my headache is gone. Really? He tried with another person and it worked again. He asked me if it works for lower back pain. I encouraged him to try it. He tried it and it worked well. He was shocked and asked me what kind of method it was. I said it was Buddha Dharma. He said, but you haven't empowered me. I said, oh, I forgot about it. He asked, it still works even so. Yes. I said, let me empower you. It'll be more effective. I used my two hands. I didn't mean to trick him, as I'd already empowered him. I used both hands with vibration. My hands were vibrating. I asked how he felt, and he said his lumbar was comfortable. I was giving him all my energy. I don't trick people. This man was honest. He practiced with me in a past life so I gave him all my energy. After that, he became very powerful and a great master as well. This is the meaning of Buddhas giving predictions of future Buddhahood. Buddhas don't have to touch your head with their hands. I remember I saw an image of Amitabha Buddha, where his hand was stretching down like this. You will feel that Amitabha Buddha is giving a blessing, a prediction. Standing below, he'd touch your head. What if you have shoulder pain? It works equally. So, a part of this phrase describes the posture. People who receive Buddha's prediction of future Buddhahood have achieved supreme attainment and wisdom. Okay, I hope everyone understands. When we do a little meritorious deed, we can gain great benefits. It's amazing. That is all the explanation of chapter 9. See you next time. Thank you, Master.
身边的神奇，我智慧了，我宽容了，我慈悲了，我自在了。因为有了你，生命变得更坚定，不要犹豫。因为。家的红点里，人生就此欢喜。我快乐了，我健康了，我幸福了，我美丽了。在茫茫人海之中，让我与你相遇。小小的红点里。人生变得神奇，我智慧了，我宽容了，我慈悲了，我自在了。因为有了你，生命变得更坚定，不要犹豫。因为。不再有哭泣，不再有恐惧。
下的红点里，人生就此欢喜。我快乐了，我健康了，我幸福了，我美丽了。在茫茫人海之中，让我与你相遇。小小的红点滴，人生变得神